All right, the Reds, welcome to Tuesday's Talking Reds. Uh, we're only doing two a week now because we've, we've, we've scaled it back a little bit because there's not too much in the way of football to talk about at the moment for obvious reasons. Uh, but delighted to say that today I've got Phil Scraton with me. Uh, you may well know uh, he's an academic, he's a campaigner, he's long been involved in the campaign for justice for Hillsborough, been involved in documentaries, wrote, for me, the, the, the definitive text on the subject, which is this. Uh, Hillsborough, The Truth. Um, if, if you haven't read that book and you need to know a little bit more about the subject, I would recommend that. And I think I think we assume sometimes in our, uh, our red bubble, if you like, that everyone knows the story and everyone knows the ins and outs when they certainly don't. Uh, and we still do get some divvies, unfortunately, on social media showing just that. Um, but that book is, is excellent. It, from the start to the finish, it tells you everything you need to know. It's still available out there, uh, so go and get involved with that. But Phil, yeah, delighted to, to have you on, especially at this time of the year. I know you're, you're close friends uh, with a lot of the families. You're close friends with a lot of the survivors as well. You've been involved in memorials and stuff, services in the past. Obviously, this year, because of the unique circumstances around the coronavirus, it means that you know those things aren't really going to happen. A lot of people will be missing the comfort of, of human interaction, of friends, of routine as well, of the things that they do around this time of year. And while there are, you know, there are still things that are going to happen, so the bells of Liverpool Town Hall are going to ring 96 times. Uh, some of the main buildings in town will fly flags at half-mast, uh, and between 3 o'clock and 3.10, the big screen outside Lime Street will display the words never forgotten. Um, but, you know, as I say, a memorial schedule for Anfield has been postponed. Um, and relatives of those who died and the survivors have suggested they're displaying something in your in your window. Uh, and there has, there's been something we've been sharing uh, on the Anfield wrap, uh, which is someone who knows Richie Greaves, uh, which is something you can colour in and put in the window. I got my daughter to do that. I've got that up now. Um, and I think little things like that, Phil, and, and being kind on social media, uh, given the circumstances, are, are going to be massive to, to the families and the survivors, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, thank you, Gareth, and thank you for the invitation. I... I think it's really difficult because uh, this was going to be, I think, probably the last uh, memorial at Anfield. So it was it was set to be a very important and significant moment. Uh, and I think one of the issues that is very clear to me, being close to a lot of the families, is the families have their own private time on the 15th. Many go to cemeteries or visit their favorite places or places where they'd been with their loved ones previously uh, in memory of those who were lost and then they come to the memorial i think that one of the things about the memorial and i've been to all of them since the beginning and with the families and one of the things that is very clear to me is when we arrive it's somber it's quiet it's calm it's uh, almost nervous in anticipation. And yet everybody knows what is going to happen. It's going to be the same order of service. And then we walk into the stadium and the many thousands there, and there would have been many thousands there this year. And at that moment, the sort of somber feel lifts because there's real solidarity in the stadium. And it's always a very respectful service. It's always a service that is really non-denominational. It's inclusive. Uh, it includes those who don't have any belief. Uh, and at the, the end of the, 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 the service, you never walk alone, always brings people together in that reminder, not just of Anfield's anthem. That's important, obviously. But in terms of the fact that as a, as a community, we don't walk alone, we are together. Whatever people's individual differences, whatever their backgrounds, whatever their politics, all of that is put to one side because at that moment, it's a real expression of solidarity. And I think that going in for a cup of tea and a bun afterwards, you see that difference between the, the somber feel beforehand, the respectful feel beforehand, but now a solidarity, a humor, people 
laughing and chatting. And it, it's, it's almost like the bubble has burst. But there's no disrespect in that to the 96. There's no disrespect in yeah. that to, 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 to the memories. It's, it's, it's an act of real solidarity. And I think that that's one of the issues for me that is going to be absent this year. I, I've got calls. Um, we have a, a Zoom conference with a group of families afterwards tomorrow. But it can't replace that moment every year when we all get together. And of course, I'm privileged to be in that position because as I've said so many times, I didn't lose anybody at Hillsborough. I didn't suffer in the way those families and survivors have suffered. I didn't survive Hillsborough. And I think that, you know, for me, just to be there, to be part of that very privileged moment is something that always has, has, has been with me and my family um, down, the 30, down the 31 years. And Phil, I mentioned at the top, sort of, you know, the idea that we, we can sometimes be in our bubble as people who are close to the hills with disaster to, to survivors. Uh, you know, we'll all know someone personally. And, you know, we had Damien Cavana on the on the main podcast yesterday, who I know you know. Um, and obviously he was talking about things like, you know, the, the inquests and, you know, the, 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 the fresh verdicts from those fresh inquests about the unlawful killing and exonerating the fans' behaviour and all the rest of it and that being massive. But there have been some knocks since then, Phil, and I just wanted you to talk about sort of where where all that's at now, because I know we've got people watching from all over the world. We even have people watching who don't support Liverpool as well. And to them, they might not be as close to it as we are. So I thought, you know, this would be a good time to sort of talk about where it's all at right now. Well, I think, you know, I think that's a really important point that you make, Gareth. You know, I think that one of the, the issues that uh, I would want to say is that for those who don't have any history with Hillsborough, or in, indeed are too young to have remembered Hillsborough, many of the people watching this weren't born at the time uh, of, uh, of, of Hillsborough. I think just very briefly to go back to the beginning when the odds were stacked against the families and survivors right at the outset. And, you know, obviously there was a home office inquiry, there was a criminal investigation, and there would be, uh, within two years, there would be the first set of inquests. But everything was stacked against the families. Uh, the interim report by Taylor, of course, uh, stated that there was a failure in police control. But Taylor failed to go into the background to Hillsborough because, I mean, that report came out within a few months. And it failed to actually look back at the detail of the context in which Hillsborough happened, the state of the ground, the safety, all of that, they were mentioned, but there was no in-depth work on that. Uh, and I think that by the time his final report came out, not that much later, he had kind of almost backtracked. He, he hardly mentioned Hillsborough in his final report. Then we had the decision that was taken that there would be no criminal prosecutions, that there was, it was decided that there was insufficient evidence um, to prosecute. And so there, was, uh, there, there were no prosecutions. This opened the door then for the inquests and the families went to what was then the longest inquest in legal history. They went across to Sheffield. And of course, after all those months of traveling, the verdict was uh, accidental death. Now, you know, whatever the legal phrase accidental death means, to the world, accidental death means that people died because it was an accident. And all involved, everybody who had been there, everybody who'd borne witness, everybody who had survived, knew the state of the ground, they knew the problems they faced, and they knew that it was anything but accident. But that more or less ended the case. I mean, there were appeals, but they they were um, they were knocked back. You know, the appeal to whether well, it was a, to judicial review stated that the inquest had been excellent, and so it was. It was at that point when Jimmy McGovern made his excellent film Hillsborough, and obviously I worked with him on that. And then after that came a, a sort of hiatus. Yeah. This film was brilliant. It was shown all over the world. Everybody thought, well, something must happen now. Nothing happened. 
that's when I decided to write the first edition of Hillsborough the Truth, which when you think of it was 1999, 10 years after. And I thought, this is it. I'm going to demonstrate all that happened, all that happened in the review and alteration of statements, et cetera, et cetera, which I'd, I'd uncovered. And I, it looked to me as though with all the coverage in the media, this was the moment and nothing happened. And then we had the 10 years until we get to the 20th anniversary. And at that point, and this is the only time in the entire history of the memorial that fans interrupted, chanting justice, justice for the 96, right throughout the stadium, which was packed. I mean, it had 30,000 people in there. And it was that moment when the government... Uh, specifically Andy Burnham, who was um, Minister of State for Culture, decided that there was going to have to be a change. And we wrote the proposal for the Hillsborough Independent Panel. And that's the, that's the current story. The current story starts in 2012, when after two years, the Hillsborough Independent Panel went through, uh, and I, was, I headed the research, with my research team in the university, we went through two million documents. We went through documents from 50 plus organizations and from many individuals. And we had 153 findings, which completely reversed the all that had gone before. It was what the fans knew. It was what people in Liverpool knew. But what this did was it demonstrated chapter and verse from the documents, from the official documents, which had been uh, neglected by the previous inquiries. It demonstrated where culpability should lay. And that hundred, those 153 findings then changed everything uh, immediately. Uh, and I was in uh, the Anglican Cathedral in Liverpool delivering that report. I was on my feet for uh, the best part of 50 minutes. And when that ended, and we went straight on the big screen to the House of Commons, where David Cameron as Prime Minister, Tory Prime Minister, was addressing a packed House of Commons, and he made a double apology. That was the moment when we realized that the, the panel's work had changed things. What he apologized for was a disaster itself, but also significantly, he apologized unreservedly for the failure to appropriately investigate the, 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 uh, the, the disaster and the context of the disaster. And of course, that, that led to the new inquests. I mean, the inquest verdicts, the previous inquest verdicts were quashed. We had new inquest with full legal aid, so all the families could be properly represented, which they hadn't been at the first uh, at, at the first inquests. And it took a year to prepare for those inquests, and then two years of hearings before we get to what is one of the most significant verdicts in the history of the coroner's court in the UK. It was that uh, the fans had been unlawfully killed. And by this time, by the time we get to this point, our campaigning through an organization called Inquest Down the Years had brought about what are called riders. These are additions to the verdict that can be made in the court by the jury. And in that court that day um, in Warrington, they not only delivered uh, the verdict that the fans had been unlawfully killed, they also delivered a verdict which criticised, with 26 riders, criticised all the authorities, the majority of which, 15 of the criticisms, were directed towards the South Yorkshire police. And then, the most important thing for Liverpool fans was when the jury was asked, did the fans in any way contribute to the disaster? The foreperson of the jury, she just sat there and said no. And that was it. 
And that was the that was the moment. So what did we have at that point? We had a Hillsborough Independent Panel report, which chapter and verse went through everything, going right the way back in history, unpacked all those documents, and gave 153 substantive findings, which were all directed towards the authorities. The panel's report exonerated the fans. Then we have the longest inquest in legal history. What do we have at the end of that? We had an unlawfully killed verdict, so the fans had been killed unlawfully. And associated with that were all of those criticisms of the authorities and the exoneration of the fans. That, for me, was the moment. When we got to that point, as far as I was concerned, what had been achieved was justice. We were spelt it out in no uncertain terms. Of course, that we then go on to, to prosecutions. And the decision is taken to only prosecute six people out of over 20 that had been recommended by uh, the Independent Office for Police Complaints and by the Director of Public Prosecutions. He, he came, what they came back with was a decision, the Crown Prosecution Service decided only six people would be prosecuted. But most significantly, only two people would be, would be prosecuted for the actual events prior to the disaster or during the disaster. In other words, only two people would be held responsible. One was the, uh, the secretary of Sheffield Wednesday Football Club where the, the match was held. And... They, that was it ended up that being one very minor charge. The other was the senior police officer who'd already stood trial once, uh, David Duckenfield, and of course eventually uh, that jury found him not guilty. But the issue for me in all of that was that the actual potential for prosecution had been diminished so much. First of all, by a lot of people who were responsible or partly responsible dying in the, med in, in the interim period, but also the decision that was taken not to prosecute those who had some role to play in Hillsborough other than David Duckenfield. Uh, so I was, always, I was always ambivalent about the fact that one man would be for whatever his responsibility one man would be carrying the can for all of this and that's when i kind of reverted to the inquest and said nothing can change that verdict that the fans had been unlawfully killed nothing can change the fact that that jury gave very detailed account of who was responsible and nothing will change the fact that they exonerated the fans, as had the panel report previously. And, and there is a, there's another trial, isn't there, Phil, in 20, well, scheduled hopefully for 2021, which is one of the reasons that we still have to be careful around some of the stuff that we say in the public domain. And I think, again, just to, you know, not everyone who will be reading this stuff online or watching this video even, you know, understands why that is or, or understands why they can't speak out about it. And you, you see, I see when I'm on social media, I can see people being really frustrated about it. You know, the club put something out again, rightly so, saying, you know, we are approaching this time of year. Uh, just be careful about what you say online. And it, it, I just wanted to get into that a little bit, Phil, about, you know, why that is and, and, what, and what, what, why we have got to be careful. I mean, essentially, it's because... You know, defence solicitors, defence lawyers, defence barristers can point to that, can't they, and say this is this is prejudice and this trial, it, this could potentially influence a jury. It, it's that type of stuff, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, as we approached the David Duckenfield trial, it was quite clear to me that I was being monitored personally. They sent uh, somebody to monitor one of the lectures I did in Leicester. And then that was submitted to the, it was taped, it was unofficially taped, it was taped without permission. And that was submitted to the, uh, to the judge, the trial judge. 
Uh, and the trial judge said I was, he considered I'd sailed quite close to the wind, but that was, uh, but there wasn't sufficiency to hold me responsible. Um, strangely, they never withdrew Hillsborough the Truth, although there was an attempt to do that. But Dan Gordon's definitive film, Hillsborough, has not been shown since. Yeah. It's been scheduled every year and has not been shown since. This is the biggest clampdown on information, the biggest clampdown on um, openness. I mean, the Hillsborough Independent Panel report's been taken offline, for example, yeah. and all of its all, all, all of the data that we collected is inaccessible. So for all these years now, since 2013, we've not been able to, well, 2014, we've not been able to access this material. So where are we now? Where we are, we've got um, three people, uh, the, the, the former solicitor for the police and two, two police officers who are standing trial. And that's relating to what happened afterwards. It's relating to the review and alteration of statements. That much we can say because that's in the, the public domain and that's what they're going to be charged over. It's going to be charges relating to the review and alteration of statements. But none of that is uh, relevant to what actually happened at Hillsborough. That's what happened after Hillsborough. Yeah. And I think that the media, quite understandably, has been cautious in holding back on anything that might prejudice, um, any statement, any comment that might prejudice that trial. But it seems to me that that is a very hard reading of the reality of the law because they are not being charged with anything to do with the actual disaster itself. It's what, the, what happens afterwards. And it's my understanding now that that, uh, that trial will not possibly even be held until uh, 2021. Yeah. Now, the point of that is that that's not to do with the coronavirus. That is because... Um, one of the one there are problems with one of the uh, in the personal life of one of the um, one of the defendants. So that's being held back. And what this has done has more or less silenced the film. It silenced all almost everything. I I can't publish much anywhere. I have hardly published anything since two thousand and thirteen um, because people are so cautious. Yeah. Uh, of the fact that it will disrupt the trial. So that's the, and, and that is, it is really important that um, people watching this um, don't go over the top with comments on social media. Uh, of course it is. But it doesn't stop me from being able to say what I've already said about the disaster itself and the responsibility um, for the disaster. I'm not talking about what happened afterwards. I've written that up anyway. That's already in the public domain. Um, but what I'm really concerned about is that a whole generation of people now are not being able to access the primary material relating to Hillsborough. I have um, emails from scholars and students all over the world asking if they can get access to the panel's reports, asking if they can get access to the archive. And, of course, they can't. So this is silenced. Um, you know, at a time when we would expect there to be a lot of academic activity, a lot of comment, a lot of uh, coverage ar around um, Hillsborough, it's more or less silenced Hillsborough in the public domain. And I think that that is inappropriate. I think it's absolutely yeah. correct that we should never speak about anything that might influence a jury in a trial. I, of course, I understand that. I work in the school of law. But at the same time, to overstate that, to say, oh, we can't put anything yeah. out of Hillsborough, I think is really problematic. Yeah, just bringing it back then, Phil, to, to, to finish up, really, you know, it, it is a time of year that's difficult for a lot of people uh, you know, so you survived Hillsborough, who had loved ones who were at Hillsborough, even people, you know, a lot of people sort of keep it all in and don't even talk about it whatsoever. I'm sure we've all got friends like that where, you know, maybe the dam's burst one time and you've been like, wow, I didn't even know you were there, that kind of thing. So yeah. it, it's hard It's hard for a lot of people right now. And I think just wanted to get the message across again, really, that, you know, if, if you do know someone, particularly now where there's all sorts of 
having to follow the rules around, you know, lockdown, isolation, whatever you want to call it. It's just a nice time to put a call into someone, isn't it? To, to do a Zoom call, to do a Skype, to just drop a text message because it may be a really difficult time for people right now. And I know, we, I know you want to talk on that, but I know you also want to finish up with the, with the poem as well, Phil. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I, I mean one of the things, Gareth, that I, I, I'm always a visual person and I, I try to um, tell, tell the real stories through stories. And there are two that stand out in my mind. Um, I, I, I was being picked up. I, I stayed in Brompton, Brompton Avenue when I was over for the, uh, for the, for, for the, the work of the panel. And I used to get picked up by the taxi drivers to take me in. And one morning we were halfway along Prince's, um, Prince's Road and he, 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 t he turns to me and he said, so are you the Hillsborough guy? And I said, no, I'm, I'm somebody who does, does work on Hillsborough. And the he said, yeah, I know who you are. He said, I'm going to have to stop the car. And he stopped the car and he burst into tears. And we were 15 minutes in the car as he told me his story of Hillsborough, he was a survivor. He'd never spoken to anybody, anybody at all, not even his partner, his family, about his experiences on the day. And in the end, I, I was there, you know, right there in, on, on, on the avenue, sort of talking and having to get to the meeting. And that was a moment of real realization. I knew it already from many survivors about the isolation of survival and also the isolation of bereavement from many of the bereaved families. And I think that that was, that was the first instance. After the report came out, I was walking along Dale Street on my own. It was a beautiful sunny morning. And I was reflecting on all that had happened in the cathedral, all that had happened in my home city, you know, all that had happened around the, 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 the media coverage. And I saw this guy running towards me and he was running straight at me. There was no one else around. And I could see he was excited. I knew it wasn't, you know, there was no offensiveness. And he, he, he got to me and he, he grabbed me and he picked me up, which is some feet. And he, <laughs> he turned me around and he put me down. And he said to me something that I'll never forget. He just looked at me and he said, Phil, I just want to thank you and all who've been involved in the fight for justice. He said, I'm a Liverpool supporter. I was in the Leppings Lane end. And he said, and no one ever believed us. And he said, I have walked, he said, through my own city all this time with my head down. And he said, today is the first day I walk through the city with my head held high. And that one statement from a survivor, that one statement from somebody who witnessed everything happen, was just so important and significant to me. Not for me. Not, not for the people who'd worked on Hillsborough. It was so important to get that message across to a wider group, how long, how this, when people say, Margaret Aspinall said at one point, I hate this word closure. Closure doesn't exist. And I, I agree with that, absolutely. Not just in terms of Hillsborough, but all the other work on Dunblane and deaths in custody and stuff that I've done. There is no such thing as closure. What there is, is hopefully, a just outcome. But people this week going to the gravesides, people this week remembering their loved ones, survivors reliving as they do every day, reliving that dreadful day all those years ago. Those who've lost loved ones on the way. We talk about the 96, and that is so important. But the real number of people who died as a consequence of Hillsborough is much higher than 96. It's in the hundreds, premature death, people dying and never knowing what came out of the inquests uh, eventually, not knowing what came out of the panel's report. 
those people who contributed so much, some who took their own lives because the stress of survival was so great. We don't know the full number of those who've died as a consequence of Hillsborough, and we don't know the full number of those who've suffered as a consequence of Hillsborough. Young ones who weren't even born at the time, but have had to live with the grief within their families. That's what the 15th of April is about. It's about supporting their struggle, supporting their lives, and remembering their loved ones. And it was, I was trying to find a way of expressing that at the same time as being positive about all that the families and the survivors has achieved. And I was over in the States in Amherst, um, and I was flying back for the memorial that particular year, 2013. And the families had asked me to say something at the memorial. So I, I'm not a poet, but I wrote their voices will be heard. And this is it. With early spring sun came warmth and hope, spirits lifted through snow-capped hills, streets alive with nervous laughter, another adventure in another place, vibrant voices breaking solitude silence. Approaching Hillsborough calm and joyous, walking expectantly to a Wembley final, safe passage ended down that fateful tunnel, in pens like cattle between concrete and steel, desperate voices so cruelly silenced. From callous indifference in a gymnasium's cold to taking blood from the innocent, the young, their deaths examined through a distorted lens, rupturing further families' broken hearts, bereaved voices cowed by contempt. Lies tripped easily from forked tongues, condemning, vilifying the rescuers, the brave, relentlessly feeding pens filled with poison, rewriting the truth, spreading deceit. Survivors' voices, denied, dismissed. Verdicts and judgments, they came and went. Lawyers and politicians minced their words. A city portrayed as racked by self-pity. In people's isolation, now complete. Determined voices, now walking alone. Shattered by loss, but unbroken in spirit. In the face of injustice, you never back down. You forced them to listen. You sacrificed your lives. You bore witness with dignity on the day of reckoning. And their voices, your voices, have been heard. Great stuff, Phil. Thanks very much for coming on today. Um, I think it was important that we did something, you know, on this today. I hope people have appreciated what Phil had to say. Uh, as I said earlier, I do recommend Phil's book. Also, we have done stuff, been fortunate enough to do stuff with Phil in the past. So if you do subscribe to the Amphi app, you look up Phil's name on the archive, you'll see a few, a few things that we've done together with Phil in the past, including his own story, which is fascinating in itself. Uh, listen, it is that time of year. Take care of yourselves. Take care of people you know. Be nice. Look out for each other. Stay safe. Stay well. That has been Talking Reds with Phil Scraton. Thanks, Phil. Thanks a million.